I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and the other creative arts. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join for just $1 or $5 per month, or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode beginned. Today, I've got a very special 50th episode, and I chose to bring on one of my favorite people in the world, Mark Borchart. As some of you already know, he is a huge inspiration to me, both creatively and personally. We had a friendly chat about writing, productivity, his thoughts on the film Tar, and even some unexpected commentary on the concept of free will. By the way, be sure to check out Mark's weekly radio program called Cinema Tonight, because I am a devoted listener, and it directly inspired me to reboot the Carl King podcast last year. And I will put a link to Cinema Tonight in the show notes, and here we go. I am here with Mark Borchart. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Carl. Can you start by telling our viewers about your show, Cinema Tonight, like what it is and how can people hear it? They can hear it on riverwestradio.com, and I discuss films and books. In fact, it's a, uh, it's when I'm done with this, I have to research a little bit more for uh, tomorrow's episode. Well, it airs on Saturday. But it's about film, and it, it's uh, an eclectic mix of films. There's a, obviously no specific genre. It's across the board from the history of film, you know, through my uh, the prism of my viewing and all uh, the books that I enjoy and so on and so forth, many of which relate to, to uh, film. And you also get into some philosophical talk and motivational uh, positive thinking that I really like. That's just based on the premise that there's one life to live, that everybody has talent and ambition, everybody has potential, and there are so many distractions in everyday life that uh, you can fall prey to that, and you can destabilize, you know, the tra- the trajectory of your success, and you know that should be avoided at all costs. So you know, I'm saying, hey, you know, get connected to yourself, get connected to what you believe in in life. It's interesting. My previous interview with guitarist Steve Vai, he also talked about distractions and it's about how many distractions will you let into your life in one day? Yeah, that's really interesting because you really kind of have to lay down a psychological roadmap for yourself, not just goals to do, but to be and how that you psychologically handle the day. It's like, you know, a tide uh, that ebbs and flows and so forth. And yeah, you want to make sure that you hit certain points, you get certain things accomplished, and you have to disallow, you have to uh, predict potential distractions and uh, preface your day by understanding that those can come up and what you can do to uh, circumvent them so they don't, you know, alter the course of your success that day. I like that idea of planning for distractions to plan to avoid them. That's good. Oh, yeah, correct. I don't let people throw me off guard. You seem to be inspired by and love Milwaukee and want to live there for the rest of your life, it seems. Can you share some of your favorite things about Milwaukee? I'm from Milwaukee. That's where I live. It's a beautiful, huge, beautiful city. And actually, it's snowing right now. You can hear the roar of the wind outside. I've got a lot to do today, but I'll head back out there. I had some business I had to go outside for, and then I'll take a walk. And when I walk, like in these circumstances, it's it's quite inspirational. You know, I live in the city, but I also am by beautiful, beautiful woods and so forth. You're, you're just out there by yourself, so it's quite incredible. 
I was out near Detroit maybe a few months ago, and I was at an event, and I got to take a break by myself and walk out into the snow in the night and stand there in the silence, and I thought, this must be what Mark is talking about all the time. Correct. That would be highly correct. Being in that particular atmosphere with the barren trees, well, obviously during fall and winter, there's something very, very, there's a, there's a real sense of connectivity between the yourself being in the, the potential that's outside that you can bring in and so forth. And it's, it's just you, yourself out there, and then it all comes back home to you. You do a lot of writing. Can you tell me what types of projects you're writing lately? Oh, sure. I mean, I do a lot of writing in a very eclectic landscape. And three, about I woke up after around three this morning. I mean, I yeah, I do a lot of writing and for various things. But let's just say, let's take today for an example. There was something, not for anybody else, for myself, there was a deadline coming up. Uh, for a like a one act play, and I when I found out about you know this particular festival, I did due diligence and wrote like about eighty pages, and then in transcribing, you know, I had over forty typewritten pages trying to get it down to a fifteen page play. But with all the other things that I'm responsible for and obligated to and have to do, as the days and weeks went on. I realize, you know, this is just not going to happen, that you would deliver something that was underdeveloped, and it's just not worth it. Again, keeping in mind that I did due diligence, and I just realized to bring the uh, play into a further uh, plateau of maturity, a dialogue would need to be strengthened, premises would need to be narratively established in the more designed state and so forth. And with everything else that I had to do with the limited time allotted in the dim diminishment of that allotted time, like after three this morning, just lying there in the dark, I said, you know, just let it go. You'll do the play and all that, but it, it just most likely ain't going to be able to be submitted for um, this particular festival because you're the peace of mind is the in your well-being is what you want the most and it's what you're striving for and if things become obviously too stressful it's no longer worth it i mean i couldn't have written any more under the circumstances and again i knew when to let go i'll have a far better play for it you know and then what did i do carl this morning i was right back working right on it again even though i knew that I may not have that looming deadline anymore. Like with the winter and so forth, a, a number of projects take place in a particular various uh, seasonal milieus. Well, more specifically in the autumn and winter. And so when I encounter days like th that, it's just the mind, just in, especially in the early morning, is in such an ethereal state that um, it just like beckons you to uh, write. I like that idea of getting back to basics and getting right back on the bike and focusing on the task at hand, like you always say. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like after this show, again, like I say, I, you know, sometimes you're in a marginal state and like doing, working for, uh, or researching in cinema for cinema tonight. Um, you know, there's things that inspire me and so forth. And then, A, I, I begin to write for it, and it's, it becomes something uh, quite enjoyable instead of just a task at hand because you're always, a lot of creative endeavors can become, you know, just obligatory tasks, but then you want to get to that transcended point where you're actually enjoying it, and it's really good for your creative and uh, spiritual well-being. It seems like you're able to write anywhere you go. Are you able to block out everything else that's going on and just write? Yeah, well, it's not a matter of blocking out. It's just I value my aesthetic connection more than uh, outside nonsense. So you're quite correct. I have a notebook with me at all times. Anytime that I need to write and I know that I have to write it down, I'll do it. So yeah, I can, if there's people around it, it doesn't matter at all because I'm not maybe drawing from a purely inspirational 
circumstance, but rather a, a situational one where I know some of the elements and I can play off those elements and get right down to the writing. It's how you value things, and I value the work, you know, above social nonsense. Is it possible for you to estimate how many total stories, plays, radio dramas, and screenplays you have written at this point in your life? Well, I know I've written at least uh, a dozen full-length screenplays, a lot of short-form ones, three one-acts produced in festivals from Milwaukee to Los Angeles. I've had various things published regarding art or whatever, uh, if I'm called to do something. And so, yeah, d- 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 yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know what to, uh, put a number on it, but it's, it's a lot. There, there's thousands of pages written in, in many projects that have come of that. That's amazing. Is it, yeah. is it true that you like writing more than directing? And if so, why is that? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Writing is a very pure, pure thing that comes from one's being, one, one's spirit, one's intellect. It's, it's the most direct, direct connection possible to oneself. Whereas directing and so forth and filmmaking has a lot of utilitarian facets to it. A lot of, uh, hands-on things that are mechanical with equipment and getting, uh, schedules together and all of that stuff so there's it's it's limited in its aesthetic appeal i'm well versed with the camera and it is kind of like a tool of authorship when you get out there and film but it's more of a regimented thing where writing is more of a a extemporaneous thing I tend to like writing more because I just can be left alone to do my job and there's not people around and I can just it's sort of a lifestyle thing, lifestyle design almost. Do you agree with that? Correct. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I write um, seven days a week because that's that's what I do. You know, it's it's not mandatory. It's not unless I'm working for someone. It's It's just what I do in life. That's awesome. I'm curious about a term that you use when you describe some films. What does it mean to you when you say that a film is cozy? Oh, well, that's, it's, well, think of like a chamber piece or some, or like a chamber drama and so forth. There's, you're thinking about like 30s and 40s, like black and white, uh, old dark house murder mysteries and so forth. That would be, that would kind of epitomize the idea of a cozy film. And, well, and also the concept, my man of coziness is like, again, that ethereal sense of the early morning with that fresh hot cup of coffee, your thoughts and writing stuff down, that kind of crystallizes the idea of coziness. And then in the evening, you know, after a long day, potentially a cold day, if you've been working outside a bit, and it, that that warm embrace of evening, you know, with the reading lamp and the waning light outside the window, uh, that would be cozy as well. Early morning and early evening. You often talk about how time is very important to you. Can you talk about that? You you told me the other day that time speeds up when you get older. Oh, it's crazy, Carl. It's really, it's devastating. It's really, it's crazy. It Time does fly. It starts to speed up. So there's nothing you can do to stop the march of time. But there, you can make the most of the days. You can make the most of the minutes. But you have to be conscious of time because if you stop thinking about it it just moves and again the only potential remedy for that is to make the most of each day so that you carry something with you of accomplishment because if if you don't i mean i mean, i know people tons of people who are successful tons tons of people who are not focused in their the whole life their the landscape of their time is just being scorched by inaction and I will not fall prey to that. So that realigns the way that you interact with people because some are so talented for making the most of time and others just zero regard for it. And it's, it's like, it's harrowing. It's crazy. 
So, and when you're forthright with people about your identity and who you are, that works in your favor. So they, so you don't have to go through the motions and things you don't want to get into. I've heard you say a few times on your show that you don't like that term when you get some extra time. Oh yeah, yeah. All of the, all of those that, um, all of those terms that are codified. I know that. Codified is pronounced harder, but I just I just pronounce it my own way and call it codified. That yeah, there's a lot of uh, coded language people use, and a lot of uh, coded pejorative language that's employed. And I'm always aware of that. Attempt to be aware of that. And yeah, when you get no, there is what when you say extra time, you mean like people trying to waste your time, trying to get you to do something you have zero interest in. You know. Or if you're, you know, they they have various terms, say, what are you doing this weekend? They don't care what you're doing. It's kind of like a disingenuous preface to their own ambitions to involve you in their own ambitions. I don't, I don't dig that, man. Don't ask me that if you ain't interested, because believe you me, whatever it is you want to do, I ain't down with, because I've got, you know, my life to live, and I know exactly the way I want to live it. Yeah, you've got a non- uh, uh an endless list of projects you want to do and probably not enough time to ever do all of them. Carl, you, you, you've exactly said what needed to be said. It's, it's again, like I said, it's, if you don't stick to it, it's devastating. Yeah. I've got projects all over the place. And I mean, I'm just building, building them up in various, they're, you know, they're, they're like high rises in various forms of development and so forth. Yeah. Definitely. And if, if you don't tend to the garden, weeds will grow, plants will wilt, all of that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a matter of consistency and focus and maintenance. The other day, you and I did a quick phone call, and there was a moment where I could hear the pen scratching on the paper in the background, and you said something interesting. Could you explain what was happening there? Sure, absolutely. Every time I've got a phone call, which is absolutely no disrespect intended to the person on the other end of the line... But I've got stuff to do. I've got stuff to do that I can do while being on the phone. You know, I'm focused on you, focused on what you're saying, but I had stuff to sign, I had stuff to fill out, this, that, the other thing, that's what I'm going to do. Even if it comes down to folding clothes, I'm not just going to be sitting there on the phone doing nothing but having a conversation. I always, before a phone call, if I have to do a phone call, and I will have something secondary to attend to as well. That is a really it's your interesting time, man. That's a super interesting idea. I've never I've never thought of that and uh I like the way that you describe that. Hey, I'm folding clothes. I hope I don't hurt your feelings on the other end. If it's things that I can do that are, you know, very systematic that that doesn't require any thought, I'll be doing it. So definitely. I'm curious if you would describe yourself as antisocial or or what is your policy for socializing? Oh no no no! It's it's just it's not necessary. I'm not. It's not antisocial in the least. It, in fact, I l- learned the hard way about uh, too much socializing. You know, and and uh, like a Utah wildfire just raging through your days, man. And it's like, oh man, you got scorched years behind you. So no, I mean, it's I don't get any particular energy. You know, being with people talking about uh, random stuff, I mean, it, it, it has no interest for me. When I am with people, it's to be productive. We're doing, we're working on a project. I'm not going to sit around, you know, in some place talking with people about random stuff and think, oh, this is great, man. It, it's just, it's wearing. It tires me out. It depletes my energy. I have little to no interest usually in what's being said because I know specifically what I want in life. So, you know, I, I deal with a lot of people, but it's all in a uh, in a productive sense, in a productive track. It seems like you don't really like doing interviews, and I'm curious, what is it that you don't like about it? No, I don't, because they're ridiculous. <laughs> no, and uh, no offense, Carl, because this is this is a decent one. This is because we we talked about it beforehand, and that's what makes it an acceptable interview. I respect you. You've always been good to me, and I really, really respect. Now, can I mention your book? Sure. Okay. 
So you gave me your book uh, quite some time ago. Uh, so you're a creative genius now. What I, obviously I read it cover to cover, highlighted it, went back looking at highlighting. It's not like it's the first time that I read a self empowerment book or anything like that, but rather I liked its accessibility, its humor, its um, the thought that the thought that went into doing it and doing it kind of like in a uh, divergent way from a lot of uh different than a lot of other serious ones you were you were very serious about the uh, content but you also did it in a in like i said in, in an accessible uh unique way which i really appreciated but what was the question because i let no, me... it was just the question was um it just seems like in general you don't enjoy doing interviews too much Oh, about interviews yeah 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 no why? I mean, why would you interview anyone? It always has to do with an angle or so forth. Oh, and first, before I get into that, again, Carl, I wanted to, um, we should allow, again, for uh, uh, my appreciation of, of, of your book. I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, because all interviews have an angle. You don't just interview a person off the street. Hey, who are you? What'd you have for breakfast today? What, you know, are you a success? Are you a failure? Are you happy? Are you sad? No, people always have an, everything's an angle. I don't get into that. It's funny because, you know, there's a lot of people that are um, stars and like, oh, well then, you know, they're stars. Why do they have to do these interviews? Well, they have to do the interviews because they're contractually obligated. They're legally obligated to do it. Most of them, I'm sure, don't enjoy it at all because who would want to, who would want to expose themselves? Yeah, you want to promote things and so forth. Some people do and so forth. But again, half of them, again, they're just legally obligated to do interviews. They don't really want to do them. Whereas some people, yeah, they may really uh, genuinely enjoy them, you know, and they can express themselves. And I think with me that there's always this sense of artificiality. There's always this sense of the the performative in it. There's always this sense of uh, mitigating what to say and what not to say. And it just becomes like, oh man, you know, this, this is tiring trying to navigate all of this stuff, you know, extemporaneously. But like th this interview, it's, it's not bad, Carl. It's, I'm not doing them. I'm doing it because of you. I'm not doing it because I wanted to. I'm not doing it because I wanted to express myself to anyone but myself. You know, but uh, again, this is all based on you, of what the Carl King project, of what you've accomplished in life and continue to accomplish. There's a great amount of respect, a sincere respect for that and sincere admiration. And that's why this interview is taking place. Thank you. I appreciate that. I wanted to ask you about uh, some filmmaking stuff because you and I both enjoyed the film Tar. And I wondered yep. if you could share some thoughts on that. I've always liked adult films. I've always loved adult theme films ever since I started getting into films many decades ago. I always loved and was fascinated by the adult world, always was a part of the adult world. I was never really into kid stuff and so forth. So, And of tar, course, when you, when you say adult, yeah. you, you mean grown up, uh, you, don't, you don't mean pornography. Right, yeah. I, well, yeah, when I say that, I understand the... Uh, the double entendre in that thinking and that no adult films to me means adult films as in for adults instead of like people flying around in the sky. I mean like adults worried about taxes and uh, adults uh, with strenuous relationships, adults with uh, seared ambitions because of different paths in life and so on and so forth. So yeah, no, I don't feel like Oh my God! Are they going to think I'm talking about adult films? The other one, it's like, man, man, if you're if you're that brain dead, you know, whatever. Hey, yeah, you know, what the, whatever gets you through the day, man. So specifically about Tar, did you want to name a few things that you liked about it? Well, one of the most interesting things about Tar is when it starts from the get go, when she's being interviewed by an actual interviewer in real life, and it goes on. It's it's an elongated scene and a normal person, Joe Blow, would start to get restless and uneasy because they're like, oh, wait a second. This isn't what, this is not fulfilling my expectations for why I go to, to, to well, for them a movie, for us a film. And what am I doing here? This is not, I can't, you know, they wouldn't intellectually be able to uh, connect to it. You know, they, they want to see somebody flying around in the sky or someone jumping out a building or something like that. And with Tar, it's completely a psychological and intellectual exercise. And in that interview is kind of that interview at the beginning, 
sets the template of of what the film, how the film, in a sense, will narratively unravel. That we will spend time with these ideas. We will uh, is is more maze and sen than montage, where we're not excited by the act of filmmaking, but rather what occurs such as the example giving of, of that interview. And it's a, an adult woman dealing with adult issues in, a, in the milieu of an adult life. And it's a very strong, uh, it's a very, very solid, consistent, strong film, adult-themed. There was a scene in there, uh, actually more like a shot, where she's throwing all of those Leonard Bernstein records on the floor, all those vinyls. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, I'm curious. Did you notice the part where she touches her bare feet to someone else's bare feet in the room? I wondered. I'm wondering who that other person was. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't remember that at all. I mean, there's lots of details. Obviously, you did, and uh, yeah, that's that's a curious antidote uh, or anecdote in the film. I recall you once saying, and you may have just been kind of on a rant one day, but I think yeah. you said. I think you said, who cares about the plot of a film? And I wonder if you can explain that. Sure. Yeah, I'm not in third grade. I really don't care about stories. I mean, it's it's immaterial to me. I don't sit around a lot of times, hey, what was that film about? I don't know. I mean, narrative-wise, because that, that's the least of my concern. I'm more concerned about the um, psychological impact, the intellectual stirring that can be achieved by the film in ag- in aggregate all the elements of the film beyond mere uh, storytelling. So yeah, I don't I don't go to a film to to watch a story. I, I could care less. It means it means zero to me. I will be aware of good dialogue, of great repartee, um, you know, such as in films like uh, The Maltese Falcon, and um, a lot of the Sydney Greenstreet, Peter Lorre, uh, or well, like take the Key Largo for example. You you would key in in Maltese Falcon and Casablanca and so forth on the dialogue, that repartee of the dialogue. So I'm looking out for good writing, uh, which is that's a micro sense is dialogue. And in a macro sense is the overall tapestry of the narrative itself and all of the plots and subplots interweaving and so forth. So plot and story are two different things. Plotting is more of a mechanical awareness of how this overall design is being achieved while story is you know, something more uh, routine and, and it's more of a primordial overlay uh, on the film's narrative. So plot and story are similar, but also can, once dissected, can, you know, they're, they're different entities within a film that obviously subsist con- concurrently. Okay, I've got three, que- three more questions for you. First one is from a friend of mine named Chris Higgins, and he asks... I'm curious what Mark does to unwind and recharge. Does he watch movies or read or what? Uh, That's interesting because I could say that's the exact opposite because reading and and watching films are actual part of the work, but they do. Let's put it to you this way. One thing that I do is that all throughout the day, I'm aware of when I need to slow down and relax. I don't put relaxation in one room that I'll enter at some later point. It's like maybe after I've got a ton of stuff to do after this interview, but I may have the rest of the morning coffee, less than a cup, and read like for 10, 20 minutes. Then I got to get back to work. Later on, I'll take a walk, which obviously probably uh, lead to some writing and so forth. But yeah, and then I, I'm sometimes I'm like, oh man, sometimes I got to work till like eight, nine at night and I'll just accept that. So I, you know, otherwise it's freaky because you, you do want to stop and relax and sometimes it's just not possible, but it's just taking time out and knowing when to take a time out, you know, within the network of all the doings during the day and just being aware of your, uh, consciously aware of your psychology and so forth. So you're, like I say, you're just weaving a tapestry throughout the day. So yeah, reading it's 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 relaxing, but it's part of work. And uh, I wouldn't say watching a film is relaxing because I'm sometimes I'm doing work while watching it and so forth like that. But it's you know it's not like a high intensity thing. The next question comes from Modiac, and he asks, 
This is a little bit of an odd question. Do creative people actually create art or is art like math where it is discovered and not necessarily created? Well, the latter part of the question is scientific, scientifically correct because there is no such thing as free will or anything. It's like whatever a sub uh, atomic particle or whatever divided or whatever. I mean, every, every, you can't get out of anything because it's been predetermined billions and billions of years ago. I mean, if that exact same particle would split in the same way, this would all occur again. There's just not, there's not one breath, not one movement that hasn't been predetermined billions of years ago. I mean, you, you scientifically can't get around that. Consciously, of course, you forget about it. You don't think that. You just go about your day and say, hey, look, it's me. I'm, I'm taking a walk. I decided to do that. Well, that was actually decided billions of years ago. Um, there's no getting around that. But you have the, because you, you don't consciously think about it, you think, hey, I'm doing what I want, you know, and so everybody wins. That's an awesome answer. And I'm glad that that suddenly sparked a conversation about free will. That's really cool. Yeah, there, there's really, scientifically, there's, I mean, it's the illusion of free will, but it's it's been predetermined billions of years ago. Is there a final film that you'd want to watch before passing into the afterlife? Mm, that's a really good question, actually. And um, I wouldn't, I, if I, I couldn't say because it would be a false answer. For two reasons. Number one, I don't know what kind of person I'll be at that point. So it's in two, it's something that it doesn't have an answer has no meaning because the answer seems to be almost infinite. So again, in which is interesting because you, you're not going to be the same person. I might say Empire Strikes Back just because that's the earliest thing I remember watching. And that would be a nice bookend to my uh, life, watching the same film at the beginning and end. Carl, I think your answer is the most beautiful answer. It actually almost making me, making me, bringing me to tears, but that is a beautiful answer that you've uh, provided us. Is there a book that you would recommend about writing or screenwriting for someone who wants to get into that? Well, uh, um, well, again, that's I'm gonna I'll, I'll recommend some stuff, and it'll be some obvious stuff, but it'll be some. It'll be some actually sincere. What I'm rereading right now is Stephen King's on writing. That's what so, I've got written right here. That's great. What's that? That's what I've got written right here after that. That would be my answer. So there, there you go on, on writing by Stephen King. And, and that's not to preclude the dozens and dozens and dozens of other fine books and many of which I've read about writing. And then uh, did you say screenwriting or filmmaking? Writing and screenwriting. The one by William Goldman, obviously, is a classic, um, which I've read. Uh, that's it's, and then you know, obviously, you have kind of like the the mandatory, at least back in the day, the mandatory uh, Sid Field books and so forth. And then, I mean, if you really want to, I mean, just f for academic purposes, you obviously want to uh, reference Aristotle's Poetics. You know, that that being kind of like the first screenplay book where it actually identifies the uh, structure of the acts and so forth like that. But yeah, I mean, just a, as a populist answer, but a, a sincere one. Stephen King's on writing for uh, writing and then um, the William Goldman book. The, actually, it's amazing that the, the name actually eludes me since it's been in my, that name has been, the title of that book has been in my mind like for 40 years and it's just like, oh, you know, you get older, you get over so it's much information. It's funny you're saying that because right now I'm blanking on the name of it as well. And I was thinking that same thing, like, oh man, what is the name of it? Yeah, I think it has Adventures something... in the screen trade? Adventures in the screen trade, correct. Is that it? <laughs> We're yep. both showing uh, that we don't know anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's awkward not uh, remembering something obvious, but the mind can only hold so much and... After 40 years of knowing that title, it, it, it eluded me, eluded us during this interview. Mark, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here today. You are a huge inspiration to me, both creatively and personally, and I will always be waiting to see what you make next. Well, well thank you, Carl, and I can say, say the same thing about you. You've been a huge inspiration for me. Your work ethic is solid and extremely, extremely admirable. And it's been a it's been a cool interview. 
I enjoyed it. Um, and I just really, actually, Carl, I just really appreciate, you know, you for who you are and that we, actually we have this interview as a testament. And just on a side note, William Goldman, Adventures of the Screen Trade, has been read cover to cover. It's just due to age and over-information that that title couldn't have been uh, just immediately yeah. uh, brought to the fore, but that's the way life goes. And uh, But sincerely, Carl, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thank you to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as Mark Borchart always says, you gotta be crazier than hell, man. Yeah.